On Life and Meaning is brought to you by Blumenthal Performing Arts, celebrating its 25th year presenting the best in the performing arts, sharing and employing the arts as a major catalyst to strengthen education, building community cohesiveness, and advancing economic growth. Further support is provided by Foundation for the Carolinas, inspiring philanthropy and empowering individuals to create a better community. And by the Arts and Science Council, Charlotte Mecklenburg's resource hub and lead advocate for the regional cultural community, providing culture for all. Religion to me, or shall I say God to me, is in the ether between two authentic human beings connecting with one another. The experience of God is being experiencing someone's true otherness as they are and being open to it and allowing someone else to be truly them and them allowing me to be truly me. One definition of sin is separation from God. And I'm comfortable with that definition because uh, to me, God is not some being sitting in a cloud. God is all among us. It is in the relationship we have with each other. And to the extent that we hold that relationship sacred, then we are being close to God. And to the extent that we are abusing that relationship and not holding it sacred, then we are sinning or creating separation or isolation. I see so many elements in our society where we create isolation and we use it as a tool of power. And to me, that lens is powerful. And so when I think about spiritual activities, it's in that realm. Dan Murray is an orthopedic spine surgeon. He leads the specialty practice division of Optum Care, a division of United Health Group, a healthcare provider and coverage company. Dan was previously founder and CEO of Ortho Carolina, an orthopedic practice and physician group. He led efforts in quality improvement, data management, corporate compliance, and customer service delivery and contracting innovation. His honors and awards include the Care Ring Maribel Conneret Award, the Charlotte Center City Partners Special Achievement Award, and the Presbyterian Orthopedic Hospital Physician of the Year Award. He served as a Mecklenburg County Commissioner and led the host committee for the 2012 Democratic National Convention. In this episode, we explore reform of the healthcare system, where God resides, confronting injustice, and taking on difficult tasks. I'm Mark Paris, and this is On Life and Meaning. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Dan, you are Chief Medical Officer for Specialty Practices at Optum Care. What does that mean? (laughs) Well, it's a good question. Optum Care is part of United Health Group, which is the largest healthcare company in the country. Optum Care is the part that actually delivers care. So it's physician practices, surgery centers, urgent cares, and the like. I am starting a new division that engages specialty physicians in the Optum Care Network. And so our network is really focused on improving the quality and lowering the cost of care, driving more value in the care experience for patients. So really getting the waste out of the system and making sure patients get exactly what they need, exactly when they need it. And we build models that support physicians who want to do that and payment models that uh, reimburse them based on whether they achieve those goals. What is values-based care? A lot of people talk about the healthcare system being broken. And when they speak about that, they're really talking about the fact that the cost of the system is higher uh, than it is in any other developed country by quite a large margin. But the outcomes that we get, the healthcare outcomes, are no better. And in fact, in many cases, are worse. We're not the healthiest country. We're not, we don't have the best healthcare outcomes in terms of life expectancy and, and other uh, traditional measures. And yet we pay roughly double as a portion of our gross domestic product uh, what uh, European countries, other countries pay for their healthcare. 
So clearly, we are not getting value for the dollars we spend. So value-based care is really that, getting the healthcare outcomes that patients want and expect for an affordable cost. And when I started medical school, healthcare as a part of the economy was only 8%. And even then, people were saying it was an unsustainable amount. Well, we're now over 18%. And that means 10 cents out of every dollar that you spend on everything that used to be spent on roads and education and infrastructure and other things is now spent in healthcare and is no longer spent on those other important things. And so driving value in healthcare is more than just about the health of the individuals. It's about the health of our economy and our society. Values-based care is distinguished from fee-for-service based care. What is the difference between the two? So fee-for-service is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, the more I do, the more I get paid. And as I explained it, I'm trained as an orthopedic spine surgeon. And so if you see me as a patient with back pain, I get paid more if I see you quickly, charge for it, order an MRI, and do surgery than if I sit down for 45 minutes and explain to you why you don't really need an MRI scan and why surgery would actually do more harm than good. If I spend 45 minutes with you explaining that, I will actually lose money on that because the cost of my office and expenses and everything is higher than I would get reimbursed. If I saw you for five minutes, ordered the test, did the surgery, I get paid very well and your outcome would not be great. But honestly, you may or may not know that 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 was the choice that was made, that that was what happened. And so fee for service means my incentives are to do more. Value means my incentive is to make you well. Why is it in the interest of large healthcare systems to move away from fee for service to a value based care system? Well, uh, it's a good question. I mean, arguably, if you're looking only at the interest of the business entity, it may not be in their best interest. There are plenty of healthcare organizations. In fact, I would argue most healthcare organizations have spent decades perfecting profitability and fee for service. And frankly, that's a large reason why. The spend has gone from 8% to 18% is because health systems have gotten very good at, at getting profits out of this system. There's a term in the hospital world called having heads and beds is a metric of success. Well, as a doctor, heads and beds means I have more sick people. That's probably not the outcome we're looking for. And so the fact that that's a metric that people use to determine success is problematic It helps profitability, but it's not helping our society and our population get healthier. And so I think if you are an organization that is focused on the larger mission, and and that mission may be altruistic or may be economic, because frankly, if we reorient the incentives such that we're not paid based on heads and beds, not paid based on the more we do, but actually paid based on getting good care for a population and maybe requiring less things to be done, then uh, we'll get different outcomes and we'll have fewer heads and beds and a healthier population and ultimately do it for a lower cost. So Dan, you have to reconcile the profit motive with good health care. How do you do that? Well, you could ask the same question of any regulated utility, right? I mean, Duke Energy has to keep the lights on for all the homes in the Charlotte region, still needs to make a profit. And yet, We have oversight agencies that say, you know, if we're going to grant you monopoly status, then you have to abide by certain rules and you can't take overly large profits. Healthcare is not regulated in quite the same way, but it's close. The reality is, though, that there aren't uh, restrictions on how profitable healthcare entities can become. And part of my reason for wanting to get into transforming the way we deliver care is that I feel like there are elements of that that are quite unjust. Patients that come to me as a physician are vulnerable. They are worried and scared that they have a condition that's going to disrupt their life, maybe end their life, and they're seeking guidance and treatment from me. Having someone who's vulnerable pay more than it actually costs to deliver the care with a reasonable margin, having them pay more than that doesn't really feel just, and particularly when they're not aware that they are, in fact, doing that. And so I really think that to the extent that we can think about healthcare delivery in those terms of what is just to charge, what does it cost you to deliver the care? Are you being as efficient in that delivery as you can be? That should be the motivation of a health system is 
Let's deliver exactly what patients need, deliver nothing they don't need, and deliver it only when they need it. And let's make sure we don't deliver more of it than the society demands. Wouldn't a free market-based, profit-driven healthcare system lead to greater rationalization of costs and greater efficiency of resource allocation? If we had a perfect market, that's certainly possible. The problem we have now is we don't have price transparency. And so you don't really know what you're paying for something before you actually agree to treatment. And virtually no other setting would you agree to do that. Mm -hmm. In in addition, even if you were aware of the cost, they don't ultimately go back to the consumer. They're paid through a fairly Byzantine mechanism of insurance where a charge is made, a discount on that charge is negotiated by the insurer. You pay a small portion of that, which is usually a fixed amount. So whether it's a high or low amount, you don't necessarily feel that until the end of the year when your insurance premiums go up because collectively the group of people your employer hires or the risk pool you're in have spent more. And so all of a sudden you have a 20% rate increase and you don't feel like you did anything to justify that. And you probably didn't. I was in a conversation recently about this and I, I noted that wage stagnation is an issue people talk about a lot. Nobody can seem to understand why wages haven't gone up in spite of the economy growing. The reality is the amount that companies spend on employees has gone up. It's just not going to wages. It's all going to benefits and largely going to health care. Dan, Optum Care is a division of United Health Group, as you mentioned, which is a for-profit managed health care company. Aren't you also charged with ensuring profit margins and shareholder value for the physician group? Sure. Uh, and essentially, our profitability on the Optum side is derived by creating greater value because the mission of Optum Care is to reduce the total cost of care in the healthcare system. We get paid for doing that. So if we enter into models that are alternative to the current models that are lower cost, then we make more profit. So if we're able to be successful in lowering the cost of care, then we do retain some of that profitability. So it's the difference between driving towards a higher spend through fee-for-service or driving towards a lower spend. There are incentives either way, and we can be more profitable either way. If we're driving towards lower total cost of care, there will be people in the system who make less, who no longer make the profits they were making. That's got to happen if we're going to go from 18% to 14% of GDP, then there are costs in the system that have to leave. And I would argue that we're trying to root out the costs that don't add value to the patient's outcome or experience. If it makes so much sense, why is there such resistance in the system? Well, there's a lot of incumbent power. There's a lot of inertia. Healthcare is a sixth of the economy. And so it virtually everybody is employed by someone in the healthcare business or has a family member who is or is dependent in some other way by some aspect of the healthcare economy. And the health system does a lot of good. I'm not arguing that the health system is bad in and of itself. Discerning what's good healthcare and justified versus what is not is challenging, particularly when payment mechanisms are Byzantine and when outcomes are unclear. There can be longitudinal. And so sometimes you don't really know what the outcome is for quite some time. And so it is a tough nut to crack. Having said that, we've got a lot of data that shows that a lot of the care we're delivering is of low value to patients. We've got a lot of data that shows that there are systems of care that generate a lot of profit for entities without actually providing consistent benefit to patients. We need to do better. And I hear people in healthcare say that human error is going to happen and people are going to make wrong decisions. Well, I get that, but I expect the same consistency in healthcare that I expect from the airline industry. And I fly a lot and I wouldn't do that if pilots had the same amount of inconsistency in their performance that I see in the healthcare system that's currently being delivered. Dan, you've said that it's going to take a generation to figure out our healthcare system. Are you optimistic? I am. I'm more optimistic now than I've ever been. And I'm excited about what's happening. Really, for the first time in my career, I feel like people are not only open to change, but seeking solutions and are willing to pilot innovations. They're willing to 
put money behind these sorts of risks. And large institutions like United Health Group are trying to push the needle and push back on the idea that healthcare should just be a cost plus business and we can keep driving it up. So I'm excited to be part of that innovation and look for ways to, frankly, disrupt the, the things that have gotten us to the place where we are today. Dan, you've done so many things in your life, and I'd like to talk about the journey that you've led and why you do this work currently. You were born in Pulaski, Tennessee. How would you describe Pulaski? Pulaski is a small rural town. It is right on the Alabama border, south of Nashville. It was 7,000 people when I was born, and it's 7,000 people today. Far enough away from Nashville and Huntsville that it really hasn't grown a whole lot, but it also still has some factories and a vibrant business community and good people there. It's a farming town for the most part. I grew up on a cattle farm. My father was a family physician. It was a very supportive community. I um, felt like the whole community raised me there and that I had an obligation to give back to my community there because of the support that I was given. I went to high school there and graduated from Giles County High School and still enjoy going back. But it also had a very particular history. Pulaski was the birthplace of the Ku Klux Klan. And that was something that was brought to mind very frequently while I was growing up there. The The Klan would come march on the, the streets occasionally or petition to do so. Uh, there was a National Historic Site marker on the, the building in which it was founded. And so you would have people that come to town for those reasons. I was struck, though, by the response of the local community. The local community, when they would petition to march, the stores on the uptown would close so that no one was there to see the march. The National Historic Marker, it's illegal to take those down. So the owner of the building took it off and turned it with the letters facing the wall so no one could read it. So they didn't take it down, didn't deface it, but you can't really see what's there. It's clearly not something the town's proud of and has tried to find ways to move beyond. And I would argue have done a decent job of that. But I grew up with a the real understanding that we had a place in history that needed to be reconciled. And that's been something that's stuck with me for throughout my career that not everybody has the same lot in life and not everybody gets all the breaks that someone like I have gotten. And that that we as a society, as much as we'd like to say we're a meritocracy, we're not. And we don't create level playing fields and and those in power uh, don't like to give it up and that somebody has to speak to that, acknowledge that, bring that to light and force those with power and the society around those with power to deal with it. And so I think growing up in Pulaski, it was actually pretty seminal for me. What was the conversation at home about the history of Pulaski? You know, we really didn't talk about it much at home. You know, my father was one of three physicians in town, three or four. So we certainly had a place of prominence in the community. Uh, my mom was uh, <laughs> my mom was a Phi Beta Kappa grad from Duke and Vanderbilt, and she put the Phi Beta Kappa certificate in the laundry room at home. And uh, she raised five of us and was active in the community as well. And so I would say that my parents, though, they were not activists in that way. But uh, we were always taught to treat people with respect and to uh, acknowledge injustice and to work to make the community better. And that, frankly, it was our responsibility to give back in a way that was, that was meaningful. But, but we didn't really talk a lot about race. On the farm, my dad was not a farmer. Uh, he bought the farm when I was young. Uh, we joked that he bought the farm so that my brothers and I would learn how to work and stay out of trouble. And um, J.C. Patterson was hired to basically run the farm and teach my brothers and me what uh, what to do. J.C. was a foreman at the Shock Absorber Factory, had eight kids and had his own farm. And he ran our farm and raised my brothers and me. And But J.C. was illiterate. He didn't have the privileges or benefits that I had, but was a second parent, a second father for me growing up. But I also recognize that J.C. never got invited to dinner. His family didn't do things with my family. We weren't friends, and yet he was a mentor and a, a parent to me. So that juxtaposition uh, was something that growing up probably wasn't as aware of as I should have been, but certainly looking back, it's 
uh, impossible to miss. Dan, your dad was a doctor. You've described him as a Marcus Welby type physician. <laughs> How so? My dad came through medical school in a time when you basically went through your four years of school. You did a one-year transitional internship, which meant three months of pediatrics, three months of medicine, three months of OB, and three months of surgery. And then you go out and practice. So not a traditional residency where you might spend three or four years doing any one of those four. But that was fairly typical in that era in the 50s. He started out in rural Mississippi for about a year and then moved to Pulaski, where I grew up, which was just south of the town where he had grown up in Lewisburg. At that time, there were three or four docs in town and there were no ER docs or anesthesiologists. So he would take call every third or fourth night and be in the hospital and spend every third weekend in the hospital. And we'd have to go have Sunday lunch with him at the hospital because that's where he was working. And I would follow him around in the office and seeing patients and Uh, The reality is in that era, a lot of the care was talking. A lot of the care was educating. Uh, There were certainly tests and treatments that were done, but it was a much less technological era than it is today. It was clear to me that he would see 30 or 40 patients a day in the office, and that was basically what he did. And so that image of of the physician with the, the glasses on the nose and the long white coat, it, it made a strong impression on me. And it was clear that the work he did made a difference in people's lives and that he was viewed as a benevolent force in their life, which uh, was powerful to me. I've read an anecdote that you were a selective listener growing up. <laughs> yeah. So when I was uh, four or five years old, my parents became concerned that I had a hearing deficit because they would often say things to me and I wouldn't respond. And so they took me to get my hearing tested, and turns out my hearing was perfect. When I got back home, they said, you know, Dan, we were afraid that you were going deaf because we would speak to you and you wouldn't respond. And I said, well, sometimes you're just saying things that I don't want to talk about. And I think um, it's probably true that that I do try to focus on the things of greatest interest and meaning to me. I don't know that that's unique, though, but perhaps I started earlier than most. Dan, were you set on becoming a doctor as a teenager? You know, I I don't know that I made a conscious decision to go into medicine as much as I was sort of following my father's footsteps, who was really a leader in the community. And when I was in high school, I, I had a lot of leadership roles. I was president of most of the organizations that you can be president of at student council, the, the state association of student councils, the church youth organization, you name it. I liked that role, that responsibility. I felt like I cared about my friend group and cared about us doing something with ourselves. Uh, I've always wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. And uh, sometimes that means bringing a group of people together to create something bigger. And I think I sort of intuitively knew that early on in school. In our local community, doctors were leaders in the community. And so it was a form of I don't know whether it was the leadership aspect or whether it was the medical aspect or some combination of the two that really drove me. But but in hindsight, clearly, there was an element of of both. Dan, you went to Davidson College. Why Davidson and not Vanderbilt or any other college? It's a good question. I mean, I I looked in the Northeast as well as uh, in North Carolina and other places. I think Davidson had a great feel. My brother had gone there. My mom had gone to Duke and encouraged my brother to look at Davidson because she knew about it. He had a good experience there, but certainly uh, I was also considering Williams College was uh, was sort of what I had my eye on because I kind of thought the Northeast was where the elite schools were. But I like the small liberal arts feel. Coming from a smaller town, I think that probably had a level of, of comfort there. I was fortunate that I I became part of a scholarship interview process that brought me back to Davidson on three separate occasions. And each time I came back, I felt more and more convinced that it was the right spot for me and actually was fortunate to get the scholarship. And that kind of sealed the deal. It was pretty hard to turn down a, a full ride to Davidson. But Davidson ended up being a really great uh, community for me. It allowed me to explore things intellectually. It allowed me to develop deep relationships with professors and mentors, as well as other students. I mean, Davidson was a place where the students really took academics seriously. And it was okay to delve into 
deeply intellectual topics and still have fun after that. And there's a seriousness of the place, but also a commitment to service that that I would say is pretty pervasive among the Davidson community and Davidson graduates. And so that made it a good fit for me. I'm also fortunate that I met uh, my wife there. Katie uh, was a year ahead of me, and we became friends before I even had my first class there. My cousin grew up in Matthews. Her last name is the same as my middle name. And uh, she sought me out. We realized we were related, and she actually introduced me to my future wife before my first freshman class. We got married about a month after I graduated from college. Been together ever since. Dan, you studied religion. Why religion? You know, growing up in a small town in Tennessee, religion was something everybody had an opinion about, even if they didn't believe. Even if they were atheists, they had strong opinions about it. It's certainly intellectually, the idea of religion and ethics and morality, justice were topics that were top of mind for me and still are. I think on a deeper level, though, what I've recognized in hindsight is I'm really interested in what makes people tick and what makes people make the decisions or the behaviors that they act out. As a young person, religion was a big driver of that in Pulaski, Tennessee in the 70s and 80s. It still is. I think my subsequent study of politics and public policy and medicine and healthcare are further explorations of trying to understand what drives people, what motivates them. How could things be framed such that maybe we make different decisions going forward? How do I make a patient make a better choice about their care? How do I help a community make a better choice about a a policy decision or how might we reframe our human relations with one another such that we're more kind and more accepting of one another and more open in our relationships. And all of those are, to me, are different facets of the same question. You could study human behavior through a variety of secular lenses sociology, anthropology, psychology, through the sciences, through medicine, politics, but you chose the lens of faith. You know, um, religion to me, or shall I say God to me, is in the ether between two authentic human beings connecting with one another. The experience of God is being experiencing someone's true otherness as they are, and being open to it and allowing someone else to be truly them and them allowing me to be truly me. One definition of sin is separation from God. And I'm comfortable with that definition because uh, to me, God is not some being sitting in a cloud. God is all among us. It is in the relationship we have with each other. And to the extent that we hold that relationship sacred, then we are being close to God. And to the extent that we are abusing that relationship and not holding it sacred, then we are sinning or creating separation or isolation. I see so many elements in our society where we create isolation and we use it as a tool of power. And to me, that lens is powerful. And so when I think about spiritual activities, it's in that realm. I'm, I'm pretty pragmatic It's in the day-to-day experience of being with other people and how you are with other people and how you make decisions that affect other people is a form of religion. Do you think of your work as a life of ministry? I do. I probably wouldn't call it that, but I think it is. I mean, I, I often joke in my work today in healthcare that I'm prone to preaching. I, uh, I really think, look, I, I have every form of privilege that someone could have. You can check every box uh, in American society today of white, male, heterosexual, wealthy, educated, you name it. And I am pretty convinced that my job is to use that privilege to call out these injustices, to say to the all of us who are benefiting from this that we are and that it is not just. And even people in my neighborhood who I see every day, who are benefiting from injustices, it is my job to make them uncomfortable. Not just for the purpose of making them uncomfortable, but actually to actively work to try to change the system. And sometimes that means running for office and trying to do it that way. And sometimes that means trying to create a business venture that changes the the game 
but ultimately it is a ministry to seek out injustice and try to upend it. And look, it is, that sounds high minded and it is, it's easy to point a finger and say, you know, well, you came up short or you could, you could make less money or you could do things in a nonprofit way. Uh, I've tried those things. I've done those things over the years. And what I'm hopeful is that we can find the sustainable solution to upending systems of power that are not serving that relationship that I talked about of allowing people to exist and be wholly accepted. Ministry and justice is often described as uh, comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable. I think that's a pretty well stated version of it. I will say this though. I, uh, I'm a doer and it's not enough for me to afflict the comfortable. To me, we have to actually do something to change the structures that create this inequity. We have to actively try to undermine those power structures that are so subversive that we really don't even notice them until you take a step back, uh, until someone opens your eyes to them. So it has to be more than just placation and it has to be more than just speaking out and then going back to your own comfortable home. There has to be work involved uh, day in, day out of trying to find ways to do it better. When I talked about it being a generational change, it's not something that happens overnight. And that's a struggle for someone who's impatient. A surgeon, <laughs> I'd like to be able to uh, to just go in and cut out the the problem, but it's it, it's going to take a, a tenacious, long, concerted effort to do this. Dan, you went to Harvard Medical School, earning your MD, and also the JFK School of Government, earning a Master of Public Policy. What were your ambitions? <laughs> I wish I knew at the time. Um, I didn't come in with a preconceived idea of where I would end up. Uh, it's sort of part of my life journey is letting the next thing happen and, and growing into things. And I had wanted to go to the Northeast to school. I went to Davidson and that was the right choice for me. But having the opportunity to go to Harvard, which has the largest and most diverse faculty of any medical school in the world, most resources, most eye-opening opportunity, I couldn't pass that up. I really had no idea what I was getting into, though, because I thought I would be a family physician like my dad. And I got there and found out they don't even have a family practice program at Harvard. The dean said in his first address to us that they train medical scientists, and I had to figure out what that meant. But it ended up being a great fit for me because I was able to explore all kinds of new things and able to further my explorations into how healthcare is delivered and finance and how that impacts the relationship between doctors and patients. Having grown up with my father, as we described as a Marcus Welby type doctor, I was a big believer in the power of the physician patient relationship and seeing how the payment mechanisms were disrupting that relationship made me think this is really not giving us the outcomes we want. If we're forcing doctors to spend less time with patients to cut corners or to not be able to be present with them, then we're clearly driving the wrong outcomes. And it was something that was intuitive to me then that I can give much better voice to now. It led me to study that aspect of healthcare at the medical school. And then I realized there weren't enough offerings to really dive deeply in that. And that's how I ended up going to the Kennedy school. I didn't start out in the master's program, but I um, applied for the joint degree after my third year. It was a, a great program though, because it allowed me to think about health policy in the larger context of not only public policy, but how our society and government is organized and how you get things done. And so I describe it often as a public sector MBA, a lot of the same content that my friends at Harvard Business School were taking, but uh, really focused on the nonprofit and government sector. And while healthcare doesn't fit neatly into the business school or the public policy school, school government, it's sort of in between. And so it was a good training for me to be able to get formal education before moving into uh, my actual practice of health. You became a spine surgeon. Why choose spine surgery? 
when I was in medical school, I didn't think I would become an orthopedist. I, I really thought the general surgeons and particularly the trauma surgeons, it was very exciting and that that was what being a real doctor was. And you had very immediate feedback on your success or failure. When I went to the Kennedy School, I was able to take a step back and realize that, you know, the personality types to do that didn't really match with mine. And friends encouraged me to rethink orthopedics, which they knew more before I did that that was where I needed to go. And when I started my residency at, at Vanderbilt, the one thing I said I would never do was spine. It has a reputation for having challenging cases and not always having good outcomes. But that's ultimately what drew me to it was the idea that there's a lot of discernment that's required with spine. Uh, you have to say no a lot, that I understand that you're hurting, but no, surgery is not the answer for you. Let me tell you what is the answer. And I think in a certain way, very ironic way, being a spine surgeon allowed me to go back to primary care like my father and brother do, uh, that I had to really get to know my patients well. I had to really understand what their objectives were. And I had to know what my surgery could actually bring to them. If I couldn't meet their objectives, I shouldn't do the surgery. And so it was less about a technical exercise, which, frankly, I also like that aspect because it's great working with your hands and it's complex and intellectually that's stimulating, but also the patient selection process, the discernment, the need and ability to get to know your patients really well, it really was a good fit. And when I started in Charlotte, Charlotte Orthopedic Specialist at the time, no one was taking up the mantle of adult deformity spine surgery, basically people that with twisted spines or fractures. And, and so I said, I would do it. I like doing things nobody else wants to do. And so my partners gladly sent it to me. And so I became the deformity spine doctor at the time in my practice and actually like having a niche that nobody else is doing because, I mean, if there's plenty of people who can do it, then I should let them do it. I'll do something else. Is there a particular surgery you remember? There are a lot. There are a few that I remember that were highly successful, but the ones you really remember are the complications, patients who did poorly or that you injured with your surgery. And I can still see those faces. Obviously, you never intend to do that, but but bad outcomes happen, even, even if you do everything right. That's part of the challenge of doing this work is that you have to reconcile that you're going to live with that fact that someone came to you for care and they left worse off, not better off, not because you necessarily did something wrong or it was a result of their interaction with you that it happened. And you just, it's part of being a surgeon. You have to be able to live with that. Not always easy. Did you ever lose a patient? Not on the table, but I've lost some post-op. Yeah. And oftentimes they came in very sick and there was ultimately nothing we could do to change that. But, uh, but yeah, there were definitely patients who died under my care. You remember those. Dan, you established yourself as a surgeon, as a researcher, and also a developer of spine care devices. In fact, you hold a patent. <laughs> what did you invent? So I'm a bit of a tinkerer. I have a wood shop, and uh, like many orthopedists do. And there are rods and screws that we use to realign patient spines. And uh, I worked with a company to do that. I was also the, the principal investigator for a national trial for a new device called a cervical disc replacement. It was being used in Europe prior to that, and I took a sabbatical, went to Europe, learned about the device, operated with the surgeons there, came back to the U.S. and worked with a company that manufactured that. The patent I have is actually for a device to implant the disc replacement, and so we developed a, a mill that Instead of using a chisel, we could burr out a, a slot to put the disc into. But it wasn't a, uh, a major contribution. But I liked working with the engineers and development team. I liked doing the research on that realm. I, uh, I certainly wouldn't consider myself an engineer, but I guess I'm pretty practical. And uh, being able to bring the practical side in and understand what's going to make it easier for surgeons to get the job done was, was the main contribution. Dan, after your success as a surgeon, researcher, inventor, you became CEO of Ortho Carolina in 2008. What did you set out to do as CEO? I wanted to fix healthcare. It was clear to me that the way that we were delivering care was not creating the right outcomes and that we had the tools in our hands to actually make parts of it better. When I first joined my practice, 
we didn't have integrated records. We didn't have imaging in our facility. We had to get records from the hospital. We had couriers going all over town getting x-rays and MRIs and reports. It was very challenging to oversee the total care of the patient. And we really wanted to create a ecosystem in which the entire care episode was directed by their physician so that we could be responsible for that. So we brought it under our control more and more so we could direct the customer service. We could direct the billing and integration of that for the patients. We could basically take care of the administrative side of healthcare and take that load off of patients and make sure that the clinical side was under the direction of their physician, which I felt like was the expectations patient had all along. It's not different than the expectation my hometown had of my father, that he was directing their care. It's just my work environment was much more complex with a lot more technology, a lot more facilities, a lot of other doctors that were participating in the care. But taking the complexity out of going to the doctor was ultimately the goal. And once we were able to take that complexity out, then the goal became, okay, how do we put dignity back in the care experience for the patient so that they feel like they're being cared for. They feel the compassion of not just the individuals, but the system of care that they're being cared for in. And so customer service, community, building community around the patient care experience was really important to us. That's the, the values of our company were quality service, teamwork, and community. And those were chosen very intentionally because it had to be, quality was a given. Service was not always a given, and that had to be cultivated and, and had to be an expectation. It could only be delivered through teamwork. And at the end of the day, we needed to be leaders in the community, and we needed to be building community. And that was here locally, but it was also a professional community of educators and researchers and the broader health system that we needed to make sure we were caring for and shaping in a way that was positive, not extractive on the system. At the same time that you became CEO of Ortho Carolina, you entered politics and became commissioner at large for Mecklenburg County. What were you thinking? <laughs> uh, I probably wasn't thinking too clearly, I guess. It, it wasn't calculated that I would do both those things at the same time. I'd gotten engaged several years before in civic activities. I think I became aware that as I started treating patients that I was only able to impact a small portion of their lives. I could fix their spine, but I couldn't help their transportation issues or employment issues or wage issues or the built environment in which they lived. And and I realized that, that if I was truly going to have an impact on the community, it had to be broader than just taking call and doing surgery. Got involved with the School Building Solutions Committee early on, which was a group that was trying to figure out why school bonds failed and what the future of our school system should be. Got involved with the American Leadership Forum, which was uh, a regional leadership group, and recognized that Path Forward might be elective office, and I decided to run for county commission because that's where healthcare, education, park and rec, a lot of the things I felt like I had some subject matter expertise and some interest in were influenced and, and budgeted around that same time. So I announced that I was running for uh, the county commission around that same time at Ortho Carolina. I had been on the leadership group, had been a past president, and we had our third CEO leave over the course of three years. As he left, he said, you need a physician to lead this group because we needed someone who was an owner in the company to also help allow the management team to do what they needed to, to do. So I stepped into that role initially as an interim, and then after 18 months was made permanent. And so I served as CEO for about eight years at Ortho Carolina, served one term on the county commission. I got swept in as a Democrat with Barack Obama and got swept out in 2010. So only served my two years on the county commission, but, uh, but it was it was important for me for my development certainly to to learn how the city and county work to raise the profile of health community health as a important objective of the county that is something we should focus on like food deserts and 
access to healthy eating, access to care, and all the other factors, the social service factors that play into that and trying to get greater integration of those things. I was unfortunate that you know, a few months before I got sworn into office, we had the recession hit, and so we had far less money to work with. So it was largely an exercise of choosing the best of what the county had to offer and getting rid of the things that we couldn't afford to do anymore, which is not the fun part of the job, but but it was the job. What were your days like managing a complex uh, physician group as a CEO driving change and also as a new county commissioner? I was very fortunate to have a lot of help. I had a great team at North Carolina that I was working with who were training me on how to be a CEO. My first job in management was a CEO. So they clearly did more training of me than I did of them. And on the county, you know, I had some good role models and and the county had a great staff at that point. and, And really, I was quite impressed with the work team there. I set up my schedule so that every Tuesday at noon, I would go to the county offices and I would spend from noon until whenever the meetings ended, usually around midnight, in committee meetings or meeting with the staff or meeting with other commissioners and having our county commission meetings. I met with constituents when I could for breakfasts and lunches and afterwards, uh, you know, you squeeze it in where you can. But I couldn't be one of those people that was everywhere all the time because I was doing surgery and running a business outside of that and occasionally taking call. So, uh, you know, I had to decide I was going to spend 10 to 20 percent of my time doing the county commission work. So I didn't do a whole lot of photo ops. It was answering constituent emails and going to meetings and trying to do the the internal work. And, uh, you know, perhaps that's why I ended up not getting reelected, but that was the only way I could do the job. Dan, in 2012, Mayor Anthony Fox, a fellow Davidson alum, asked you to chair the host committee for the Democratic National Convention. And you said yes. What do you remember from those days? Well, I actually remember saying no a couple of times before I said yes. It's uh, I remember being in my office seeing patients uh, in the spine clinic and getting a call from Mayor Fox asking me to do that. And I said I thought that was a pretty crazy idea. Ultimately, he convinced me that that it was the right fit and that it was really important for the city. And I agreed. There were a number of reasons that it was the right time to do something different. Our company was growing rapidly and we had brought in several new practices and my team was saying, hey, we need to slow down. We need time to absorb some of this work. So if we could put a a hold for a bit, uh, that was fortunate timing because that was, uh, it allowed me to step away and have our team stay intact there and continue to do the work they were doing. I think for me personally, it gave me an opportunity to learn how to be a better leader. As I said, my my first management role was a CEO at Ortho Carolina, and I had a lot of good training from my team, but I was used to having 1,500 employees and all the systems in place. And when I started at the convention, I was the only employee, and we didn't have a telephone or business cards, and I had a stack of about 400 resumes of people that wanted a job. And I didn't know what the organizational structure was. And I had a contract that had been negotiated prior to me coming on board that I had to understand what it was that we were supposed to deliver. So it's pretty daunting. But I was able to learn how you start up a startup business, build out the org chart, do payroll, get the phones hooked up and grow it to about 50 people and then break it all down. Uh, so uh, in 18 months, I was able to go through the whole life cycle of a business, which is very instructive for me. The job itself involved raising a whole lot of money, but more importantly, it involved coordinating the interests of a lot of uh, diverse stakeholders. People, the obvious ones are the campaign and the Democratic National Committee, but the less obvious ones are the Chamber of Commerce and Center City Partners and the City of Charlotte and the County and the State and the DOT and the Visitors Bureau and the Secret Service and the police and sheriff. Turned out I needed about nine or 10 different approvals uh, for just about anything we decided to do. And so that experience of being a committee leader and a collaborator at heart was uh, pretty critical to getting that, that job done. My goal was to make sure that people saw what I think is great about Charlotte and that that came through and that, that we were well represented and that the city of Charlotte felt like this is this is a great representation of who we are. 
and that it was also important to me that the city of Charlotte get to participate in it and that it not be cordoned off with uh, guard dogs and that it just be something that happens in our community, but actually be a unifying event. You know, I, I often say that, that Charlotte was a bit of a gawky teenager before striving to tell, to have people say you're a grown up. And I had a bit of a sense that going through the convention was a chance for us to move into adulthood and say, okay, we can sit back and relax a little bit and just be a city now. <laughs> I don't know if that's overstating it or not, but you know, we've always been strivers here and boosters and we've always tried to, to uh, box in a higher weight class than we actually belong in. And I hope that the convention played a some small part in having people feel comfortable that Charlotte's actually made it. Dan, I'd like to talk about a couple of interests of yours. You like to cook. I do. I love to eat, so I had to learn how to cook. You know, for me, cooking is a way for me to uh, work with my hands, just like surgery is, just like woodworking is. But the impact is more immediate. It's also fun and creative. And frankly, it's a way for me to show love for my family and for those who enter my home. I think hospitality is important and food is is a form of connection with people. It's a way to communicate with people non-verbally that creates a different relationship with one another once you've once you've eaten together, once you've prepared something for one another. I like the spiritual component of cooking as much as the, the creative and the, tech, uh, the technical components of it as well. You collect pottery. I do. I collect a lot of things. But when we moved to North Carolina, uh, I was a Tennessee boy pretty through and through. But I really loved North Carolina. And my wife said, you know, you can get to know the state by pursuing something you love. And that was uh, collecting pottery. So we went to kiln openings of a number of potters in North Carolina and both Seagrove and the Catawba Valley and subsequently up in the mountains. And it was a way for us to get to know the state, but it was also, the reality is that that these are handmade objects that are authentic to the people who made them. And uh, it tells a story and we've got a story for every pot that, that we have. And I think uh, it creates a more warm and inviting place when you're sitting amongst stories and and images that evoke memories of people with passions. Dan, engaging in civic debate is also something you like to do. I like engaging in discourse. I like posing questions and and, uh, exploring them. And I'm, I'm very open to hearing other sides and trying to go down that path. I like being on a debate uh, where we're challenging one another and uh, we're able to draw out what are the differences in the in in our positions so that people can make their own choice. But uh, I often find that I see the world with a slightly skewed view compared to the norm. <laughs> and I've had to become comfortable with that, that, that sometimes I see things with a different angle. I've always felt myself a bit on the edge of groups. Being able to be a surgeon but have people say, you don't talk like a surgeon. Being able to be in business, but people saying, yeah, but but you're really more of a physician. Being able to be in politics, but people saying, yeah, but you're not really a politician. I was all those things. I am all those things. But I get that I'm on the edge of them. I don't necessarily fit the stereotype. None of us do, but we assume certain people do or Some people will choose to take on that mantle. I I think being able to move among multiple different worlds and being able to see things from one world and apply it in another. And sometimes it's valuable for people to hear, not always, but I'm wanting to do my part. It's, it's all part of, uh, probably, uh, trying to upend some norms that, uh, that exists and make people rethink things they take for granted, perhaps. Dan, what is most important to you? I think what's most important to me is being part of a community, being in relationship. And it's a community that needs to be inclusive. One that doesn't divide, but actually brings people together. It's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do in reality. It's a constant challenge for me, even saying that, to try to find ways to to 
let more people sit around the table, uh, to open up a spot around the campfire to let somebody in. We need to do more and more of that, and it's got to be ongoing, and we have to be tenacious about it. But ultimately, the idea that our community circles the wagons and closes the gate and nobody else is allowed in is not one that I can live with. I think we are all of our siblings keepers and uh, uh, we need to be vigilant about that. How do you want to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as someone who left the world in a better place than they found it. I think um, I would like to have a legacy of seeing problems that others perhaps overlooked or ignored or thought were too big to conquer and that whether I was able to actually fix them or not, I was willing to take them on that I'm comfortable with a bit of quixotic mission in my life. And I think, you know, it, it almost goes full circle back to where I grew up. I mean, in my hometown, I was told that you can do anything and anything's possible. And frankly, in that world, uh, as a teenager, it was made to be almost true. And so I'm still looking for the thing that's not worth trying to fix. If we know it's broken, if we know it's wrong, if we know it's unjust, why aren't we doing something about it? Whether it's health care, whether it's poverty, whether it's racial or social injustice, I mean, why are we not doing something about it? And we got to start somewhere. And I don't take the position that I can't fix it in my lifetime, so why should I start? Okay, well, I'll get it on the pathway and then hand it off. And I guess I'd like to be known as someone who started and who recognized the problem and said, raised their hand and said, I'll take that on. Thank you for your time today, Dan. Thank you. Dan Murray leads the specialty practice division of Optum Care. He received a BA in religion from Davidson College, a master's degree in public policy from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, and his MD from Harvard Medical School. And now, a personal word. There is a green and white paperback book on my shelf that I opened today for the first time in many years. The name of the book is I and Thou by Martin Buber. As I listen to Dan Murray, talk about the sacred space that exists between people in relationship. I was reminded of the essay written by Buber in 1923 that was later translated from the German to English by Professor Walter Kaufman to become the book published in 1970 on my shelf. Philosophers classify Buber as an existentialist. Existentialism is a philosophy of radical humanism. It focuses on an individual's pursuit of identity and meaning. Existentialism asserts that it is our responsibility as free and conscious beings to create meaning out of life and to develop an authentic essence. What we are is the result of our choices alone. We are responsible for the essence we create and the existence we experience. We are also responsible for creating a world in which others can live authentically. Most existentialists reject the supernatural or the reality of a god. But not all. Some existentialists work to reconcile radical humanism within a religious framework. Martin Buber believed in God and in a sacred realm. But where does God reside? In the heavens? In our heart? Buber believed otherwise. He believed God resides in the space in between humans in relation to each other. God is in how we address each other in the space between ourselves. Buber asserted that there are two basic word pairs that define our modes of existence, I it and I thou. I it is a relation in which we objectify the other. The other could be a person, nature, or God. Our ego asks, 
what can you do for me? We are only partially engaged based on what we already know about the other. The exchange is manipulative and transactional. I thou is a relation in which we are fully present. The encounter is one of mystery and curiosity. The space between is charged with honor and awe. There is humility in what we do not know. The moment is devotional and transformative. I thou cannot arise out of choice alone. We cannot simply will I thou into being. I thou also is the result of grace, serendipity or God's unmerited favor. I thou requires will and grace. Buber referred to God as the eternal thou or where the lines of relationship meet. Every I thou is a glimpse of the eternal thou. When we pray, we address God directly. We enter into relation with the divine. Buber also noted that our modern technological life proliferates I it over the I thou. We become capricious, not believing in sacred encounters, not knowing how to relate to each other. We only know the feverish world out there and the desire to use it. We can return to I thou if we live differently, if we make authentic existential choices. Which brings me back to Dan Murray. In his home, there is an attention to space. There is art on the walls, musical instruments to play, pottery on shelves, story and love abound. The space between informs who people are and what happens. Dan speaks powerfully about I Thou. His choices are a testament to will and grace. Spend a few minutes with him. His considerations are profoundly ethical. Dan asks questions about what we are doing and what effect our actions have on the world. He aspires, he fixes, he reduces complexity and enhances dignity. He helps others live vital lives. I wrote in the margins of I and Thou years ago a sentence that is the radical humanism of Dan Murray today. True community comes into being when we stand in living, reciprocal relationship to one another. This is Mark Paris, and you've been listening to On Life and Meaning. Additional support for this podcast is provided by the UNC College of Arts and Architecture, celebrating a decade of creative education in the arts and design. Thank you to our funding partners and to my teammates, Andy Goh, producer of the show, and to Chris Curriton, art and media director. This is how you can help. Please write a review on iTunes. It helps us grow our audience. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And become a patron. We are on Patreon, a crowdsourcing platform that allows you to support what you value at a level you choose. Visit us also on our website on lifeandmeaning.com. Thank you for listening.